being here. Welcome to our gallery talk today with Charlevoix artist and author Kim Rochelle. Um, this is part of our Dream to Reality exhibit here, which is open through the end of May. Um, and today Kim is going to talk about her tarot artwork and take you through her journey of the fool. So welcome Kim. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Larissa. Thank you, Erica and Mary, all the Circle of Arts that have been very patient and including today because I really wanted this to be a journey, <laughs> which made filming a challenge. <laughs> so we basically rearranged the whole tarot so we could do this, including the deuces on the backside, but we think the birds can see them, so it's going to be okay. <laughs> so the tarot, this is what we're going to talk about today mostly um and i just adore them they gave me a voice of symbols they gave me a language and they gave me a way to avoid small talk which i kind of despise right like you get right into the big talk with the tarot there's no <laughs> pussyfooting around that and they um 26 years i've been reading them and when i first was given a deck i'd already dreamt of them they were already part of me. They were, um, I knew that they were the four suits of the poker deck. And I found out later they preceded the poker deck. And the earliest cards were the, the very earliest were Persian and Chinese, but they weren't tarot. They had four suits typically, but they weren't tarot. And then they became taroki, tarokio, these different, and they were a game. And they um, had the major arcana and the minor arcana, and they became um, these four suits that are depicted in a lot of different ways. So they are the, um, and they each represent the elements, the four elements, and they still do in a poker deck. So we always, the North Star depicts the Ace of Diamonds, that's the Ace of Pentacles, which is traditionally drawn as a five-pointed star. And mine is the cross cut of an apple, so it shows the five points. If you cross cut an apple, you have a pentacle. So my coins, or my pentacles, are these sliced apples. Sometimes I depict them gold, because that's what you're supposed to do. But for this one, I left it like a natural apple. And into the east, which is me, <laughs> which is air, and um, the east wind and the sylphs, all the fairies, all the monarch butterfly wings, everything that's over here is from the east. And that's the spade or the swords, if it were the poker deck. This is the fire of the south. And that's the, um, the, the Leos. We've got a few. <laughs> and the Aries. We've got some of those too. Where are you, Val? There you are. <laughs> And the Sagittarius, which I depicted very simply here with just his arrow. But that's the um, clubs in the deck. They're called rods. They're called wands in different traditions. And then the heart, the queen of hearts that I've drawn is Gretchen over there when we get over there, is of emotion and of love and of water. And uh, they're the cups, the full cup of the water. So um, I'm going to tell a story, and I always change the names of the guilty. <laughs> <laughs> the innocents, like my son, Jake, is like, couldn't you change mine too? I mean, couldn't you just <laughs> leave me out of it? But no, the innocents are all depicted. You've got to be brave. <laughs> so it was years ago, and it was at the gym. And I was there with my friend Kimberly, the empress. <laughs> <laughs> and I had been approached previously to read the tarot again for the graduating seniors. This was a thing that I did every year in their overnight party, and we did it on the Beaver Islander, and it was uh, a lot of fun, mostly. Every once in a while there was some big revelation, but it was a great way to work it out. These kids were all on the verge of becoming, right, of flying free from here. And I love doing it, and the kids love me. They, were, they would write on paper plates, who's next, who's next, who's after this person, to keep track of themselves. And the two beautiful teachers that had asked me this year to do it 
came up to my studio that was up on the hill at that time and said, um, there's been a problem. You're not going to be able to do it. And they said, by all rights, you could because we asked you and you're not doing anything wrong, but we wouldn't advise it. There's going to be a lot of trouble. And uh, I was sort of thrown by this, right? And so this a particular woman, who will remain unnamed because she is guilty, <laughs> <laughs> had gone to the school board, had gone to the higher ups of education, and had said that we could not have someone demonic in, in the midst of our children, that they couldn't expose their innocent children to someone who was demonic. And the two teachers that were talking to me were crying. Mm -hmm. And they were saying, please don't put yourself in this position because it's only going to get worse. It's only going to get uglier. And so that morning, early morning, I went into the gym with my Kim, my workout partner at the time, <laughs> even when she was pregnant. <laughs> she wasn't pregnant. <laughs> and, we, um, and I saw that woman working out in there. And I approached her, which I still wonder what the heck was I thinking, right? <laughs> but I was compelled, and I approached her, and I said, are you blankety blank? Which I've heard since was probably just as awful as anything else that I could have said to her, that I didn't know for sure who she was. <laughs> but I had a lot to say to blankety blank, and I wanted to make sure that's who I was talking to. And she said, I am. And I said, well, I am Kim Left, and I am not demonic. And she started right off denying it. I never said that. I said, I know you did. I know you did. And it went back and forth like that, ridiculously. And then finally she said, well, it says in the Bible that you shouldn't be doing it. And I said, it doesn't. <laughs> it does not. Any more than it says hell or the Antichrist or anything else. And, it, and in the short of the story, I said, what you're referring to is a bishop in Italy who said that the, the basically, I don't know his exact quote, but it's basically the same thing as idle hands do the devil's work. So the idea of playing a game, even if it was in divination, was the part he did not like, the leisure time. The peasants should be working. They should not be playing games. This was his objection to the cards. It didn't have anything to do with theology or the Bible or anything else. And, and she was really upset that I brought that up. And then I said, I continued because I was rolling. I said, they're no different than your cards that you play euchre with. And I have more to talk about with euchre when we get to the fool. But the, I said, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. And the divination part of it, I could do with the geese in the sky. I could do with the leaves on the trees. That doesn't require cards, pictures on cardstock. But this is a beautiful way for me to be able to communicate with somebody else who doesn't read the geese, who doesn't read the leaves. So they can, I can say, see what this means. And this consistently means this. Many of these symbols go back to caves where they were depicted on the walls and to ancient Egypt and its uh, it's kind of a miraculous, I think, like Jungian says, collective unconscious way of us, our souls communicating. And when that became less productive to those that were more industrious, that became evil. It doesn't have any evil in it. So she said, I don't know why you're taking this so personally. Oh, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I said, this is very personal to me. And I said, um, her name again, because I was going to keep driving that. Mm -hmm. And I said, there are a lot of things I'm ignorant about, but I don't call them demonic. So now I want to talk to the fool. <laughs> <laughs> so the fool, the book is called The Journey of the Fool in First Person. I think that's pretty obvious. But <laughs> This was drawn after a divorce, so there was uh, less of me, but <laughs> 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 the, 
The fool is the symbol of like the fountain of potential, the fountain of creativity, without any form, without any direction, without a plan. She is just, and she's often male, I must say, she's just this overflowing um, ball of energy. She could do anything. In the process of my story, and it's, it's sort of alluded to, I did snare it from old stories, is the magician has given her each of the suits to help her on her journey. So the wand is carrying her little hobo pack. And you can see a little bit in here that the pentacles there, you definitely see the cup and the, um, who am I missing? And the sword, for heaven's sakes, because my fool is a Gemini. <laughs> the sword is displayed here with butterflies and with the spade on it. I have, um, for 17 years, I had a little white dog. And her name is Maya, but in the story, her name is Digger, because she represents the earth element, the terrier of the terra firma. And uh, my Heidi Grace, who's the lover's card in here somewhere, um, we became friends in Maya's midlife. And she said, did you pick out that dog because it looks like a fool's dog? <laughs> <laughs> And I said, no, that's just a happy coincidence. <laughs> so in the story, Digger is her faithful companion, and the fool marches forth without a thought in her head, like born in that minute. Um, so this is what we'll be going through. I've created some challenges for the camera by doing this. I had imagined that we would just traipse through the cards, but um, that's a little challenging, a little tricky. So <laughs> we're going to do it in sections. So when I finish talking about this, we'll, we'll wander, and Sarah will set up so we can do the next section. But so the first, well, the first card's a fool, the zero. The magician is the number one card, and he's already provided for her. And then we come to the high priestess. And I think she's extremely lovely, esoteric, meaningful card. Um, she happens to be my daughter. Lily grew into it. Like, I didn't have a high priestess. I fussed with it. The empress existed before the high priestess. And I fussed with this drawing of who could be so serene and magnetic in her power. Like, she doesn't have to be dynamic. She doesn't have to flash and lash about. She's the one you come to for the secrets of wisdom. And my daughter fulfills that. Also, with the old Egyptian columns that are said to be, let's see if I can get this right, Boaz and Joaquin from the Solomon's Temple. So they are depicted in like the Freemasonry and some other very esoteric spaces with the lilies, with the lotus symbols. That's part of who they are. They um, represent, and I wrote this down so I would not mess it up. Boaz is to the north, and his strength is within him. Joaquin is, he will establish, and it's to the south. So this is uh, the symbols of fertility in the little frog, the little tree frog, and the symbols of um, night and metamorphosis, they both are metamorphic, of the beautiful Luna Moth. Pomegranates are an old, ancient Egyptian symbol that the Freemasons also incorporate. The moon is of the um, feminine forever, the crescent moon holding the pomegranates in the bowl. She's of the water. She's Aquarius. She's an air sign, but she's of the water. My lily, the high priestess too. And the, um, I mean, I don't know if she's Aquarius, but she represents <laughs> the symbols of air and water. <laughs> and there's often a veil behind her, a curtain or a drape because she's the keeper of secrets, and those who are drawn to her, she will decree whether or not they should be given any of the secrets, any of the wisdom, that whether they're deserving, whether they've earned it. So I made it water because I know, like, still rot, waters run deep. And for me, and for Lily, who grew up here, it's a symbol of what could be hidden 
but is still there and precious and beautiful. So she's my perfect high priestess, and she agreed to it. <laughs> <laughs> so then the following cards go in the order of empress and emperor, and they share the same land, and they're both symbols of um, divine, these two, divine femininity, but she is the nature goddess, the mother goddess, the earth goddess, and again with the pomegranates and the rabbits, and I had to put good boots on Kimberly. <laughs> this is a symbol of femininity, the Venus and the wheat, the hay, like I talked about in one of the talks about she who suckles is also the word for hay and fecundity. I'm not sure if I emphasized that enough in the first <laughs> <time>. <laughs> And female and fetus and everything that is like lush and grand and fecund. And this is the emperor. So he's the masculine equivalent, also with the North Star again. So his is more of the earth. And he are, they both are of nature, but they say that she is the one that we want to think is nature. The mother, the loving, nurturing one. And he is the more calculated, thrifty, <laughs> um, less romantic version. So he has his tally sticks and he has his little adding machine, which I'm pretty sure wasn't <laughs> Norse or Celtic or whatever he is. <laughs> He's a combination. They're all a combination of Celtic, primarily. Norse, little bits of Egypt thrown in. <laughs> like I always say, I write fairy tales. <laughs> I don't have to be like a historian or an archaeologist. So he's, uh, so he's of the fall, she's of the spring. So they're the same, but they're also um, the different sides, like the yin and yang, like the pillars of Solomon's temple. So there's this dichotomy right from the get-go, along with the four elements throughout the tarot. I drew a lot of red and purple, especially in the Fool, because the purple is the divine, the highest chakra of the crown, and the red is the base chakra of the earth. So they're always in combination with Ru. I mean, not Ru, with the Fool, and with Ru. <laughs> but she's also, um, she can be the highest card or the lowest card, depending on how she falls in the deck. And she is this promise, this um, potentiality, the possibility. These little strawberries are the same symbol, the sweet smell of the strawberries. And when my Lisa was printing this, she's like, that was on purpose, right? <laughs> <laughs> I drive my graphics person crazy. <laughs> So that's the start of it, and the aces, and um, so we can move on to the next one, but I'll take you on a little journey in between. So you can tell that I draw a lot of my friends and my family and my loved ones, and my less loved ones if they fit the card. <laughs> Nobody is immune from the possibility of becoming a tarot card or a character in Revelations. Annie's twitch. <laughs> She's the two of pentacles, that along with Leilani's card, the, where are you, Leilani? The Two of Swords is um, turned around so we could do the aces. <laughs> so they're looking out the window. They're all happy, but they're... So she's in both Revelations and in the deck. So, thank you. Thank you both for always participating in <laughs> my fantasies. <laughs> so, of course, I had to draw my three brothers. I'm the oldest only girl in our family of four siblings and I don't know what my life would be without the three of them. Joel's the oldest and he is um, not this old. <laughs> but he was born on Christmas Eve so a lot of the Thor um, and the North symbolism, the little elves of Thor, the little goats that pull is, they say he might be an early Santa idea. Um, but the meaning, which I find very Joel of the card, is to follow your own internal voice, to hold your beacon high and follow your own light, to not be influenced by the external, to find your wisdom within. And Joel does that. He also happens to be a physicist. 
<laughs> so he has valid wisdom, right? And he has been my companion since he was born. He's very introverted, where I'm not. <laughs> and the joke has been, when I will point this out, if he's with me and other people, is he'll say, well, you always talked for me. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? Which is, again, like the flip of the coin. Like, he wasn't speaking up for himself. I mean, I had to talk for him. It was required. But when he did talk, and when he did talk just to me, he was, it was unlimited. He was not um, ever shy with me. And he could tell me exactly what I needed to hear. And sometimes a little harsh, in my opinion, <laughs> but necessary. <laughs> so my second brother, who was only almost 10 months after Joel, so his Christmas Eve birth, and then the next October, this one was born. And he's significantly younger in this drawing, <laughs> where Joel's a little bit older. They look very much the same, and they're somewhere in the middle here. Um, so he's my charioteer. He's my zoologist. It's his degrees. He works as a lab tech now. Um, he does a lot of PR for Michigan Scientific, the company they both work for. He's a, and the meaning of the card is like a riddle. The chariot is like a riddle. And it's, it always has two steeds. Sometimes, I made mine winged horses because I love winged horses. But sometimes they're dragons, sometimes they're goats, sometimes they're any kind of two steeds that will pull this chariot. It symbolizes Apollo. That's why he had to have the gold ringlet curls, right, that he did have as a young man. It symbolizes Apollo zooming across the sky like the sun. And so, the riddle of it is, like by the time the fool gets here, she's been through quite a lot already, and she's talking to the charioteer about, we must fly. And the horses, in her case, are stomping their feet, and they're looking away from each other, and they're kind of distressed and annoyed with the whole harnessing of themselves. And uh, through a lot of work with Digger, the dog got her up there, she decides... He says, how well they fly. And she said, I've been watching them from the plateau as I approach this cliff. And when one is ebony, the other is opal white. When one is green, the other is red. They are the complements of each other, and I think they're two halves of one thing. So they can't do anything else. Like when you know they're only one, as much fuss as they make, they will fly. And as soon as she says that, they leap <laughs> into the sky. And he's laughing because he's joyous that she figured it out. And she has to pull the dog on board, and she gets on board, and they fly across the sky. And uh, it's very Randy to me. He's always going to give you. <laughs> Jacqueline's here, and she knows Randy too well, right? <laughs> I know. <laughs> he's always going to give you the counter point, right? Any idea I ever had, he'll be like, oh, by Kimmy, <laughs> you've got to think about. <laughs> and as my zoologist, he's the one I call if there's a wounded bird, if there's any sort of story going on, and uh, always him first. I have a brother for all seasons and all reasons, right? This one's for all the wounded little wildlife. If I find scat, <laughs> he's an expert on scat. <laughs> this one, if it's very much uh, philosophical or um, it's very scientific, but in he'll go quantum with me. He'll go very abstract and bizarre. And so the third one, this one's our baby, and we all consider him our baby. This is Matthew and Matt. I call him Maddie too much too. We call this one Jojo and this one Rand. <laughs> Sometimes they're okay with it. <laughs> but Matt Schneikenberg, is a professor of rhetoric out at OIT, Oregon Institute of Technology. And you can tell, I was 11 when he was born, so I'm like proud mama, almost, as proud big sister. He was my baby. And, uh, <laughs> and when he was younger, these two are so similar, people mistake them for one another. People will say, I saw one of your brothers downtown, <laughs> because they both live here. And I'm like, did he have a dog? <laughs> that would be Randy. <laughs> but 
But this one, so he was nine when this one was born, and uh, he's all our baby, the youngest, and he is most poetic, most like me. Um, when he was in high school, he said, I think when I grow up, I want to be an artist like you. <laughs> and I did my darndest to talk him out of it. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> like, this is not the easiest path to follow. I think there, you have other gifts, other talents that you should explore. And then he went to school and he studied English literature and at Michigan State, and everybody was worried about him. Like, what are you going to do with English literature? And he wrote poetry, beautiful poetry. And he then um, called me and he said, I've decided what my master's is. And I've been accepted to Washington State University. And I'm like, what? And he says, rhetoric. <laughs> and I was a little stunned, you know, like that didn't seem a whole lot better than being an artist. <laughs> and I was like, what is a rhetorician? Like, I know a rhetorical question, that's all I got. And I'm only a little vague on that. So what's a rhetorician? And I, I remember I asked him specifically, what do you do after you brush your teeth? Like, what's your life? I don't know what a rhetorician's life is. And he said, rhetoric, rhetoric is the meaning of words and language, completely dependent on who is speaking and who is listening. And we have had endless hours of conversation about that because by now, you know how I am about the etymology of words, about how I am about the earliest meanings that we can dig up. And I think there's pre-proto-Indo-European words that led to those. And he and I can break it down. Any kind of bizarre statement that is obviously to persuade, to say nicely, or to manipulate people, he and I can, I'll be like, I heard this thing, and we'll bust it down and get to the deliberate nature of it. So I literally have a brother for all seasons. <laughs> but the meaning of the hangman card is some say he's like St. Peter, who requested to be crucified upside down um, in honor of Jesus, or Yeshua, as I call him. Some say he's Odin, which I used a lot of the symbolism of Odin, um, who hung from Yggdrasil, the ash tree, and um, to become enlightened, kind of like Buddha under his tree, to become enlightened to find the... Um, eventually, the Norns took pity on him. They kind of played with him for nine days and nine nights. He gave, gave him an eye. <laughs> and they gave him the runes. And he, they gave him the runes, and that's where he found his enlightenment, find his symbology, his way of depicting things. But I put the cock in the tree for Peter, who would betray Yeshua three times. And the possum has his secrets, her secrets, because I like the females with their 13 little tits. <laughs> so that's the meaning of, there's a lot, of course, these are Freya's flowers here. There's lots of different secret things in every single one of these. And we talked about it, Sarah and I, like we can't tell all the stories about all the stories <laughs> in the time that we have. So this is truly, you could break the journey of the fool and the story of the tarot down to these four cards. Um, we already talked a lot about the fool. And the part I was going to say about the unnamed euchre is they believe that's where joker comes from. It's a German word, and it actually is Juker. And it's the highest power, which meant farmer in German, and that's where Juker comes from. And the um, jacks are the highest I don't. I've told Annie, I've told different people, I only play Juker drunken at a party when they need another one. <laughs> <laughs> so I've never actually learned the game. They sit me down, they tell me what to play. They're always mad at me, but they're mad at me if I don't do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> Euchre's not my game, but I've read about it. <laughs> I've discussed the <laughs> physics of it, the zoology of it, and the rhetoric of it. <laughs> That's how I live, you know, just outside of reality. <laughs> But so the euchre, um, the joker, is the highest jack, like the highest farmer. And in the early tarot, the very earliest, he was like wild man. And then he became sort of this court jester person. 
And then as the court cards got more established, he became like the court jester. So that's when he got all that stuff on. But there's still, to have him be the wild card or her be the wild card is from the wild man. The very earliest, unpredictable, full of energy character that she remains today. So I think that's super interesting about the fool. So, <laughs> in my story, there's the lady and the lord, and they live in this perfect, idyllic world. They're um, too perfect for the lady. And she says, I need more. I need to explore. I need to find out more of what this existence is. And she decides to go on a vision quest, which the Lord is very unhappy about. <laughs> He's like, why? Why would you leave our perfect world? They have passion fruit growing on their little pillars there. And she says, because it's perfect. This isn't all that there is. This isn't all that is real. This isn't all that love is. And despite him, she goes into a meditative state and wakes up the fool without any memory of herself. And she is that innocence that just goes forth without a plan. And he, because he does love her, crazy woman that she is, he comes as the magician. He's very much like the accidental tourist. <laughs> like he doesn't want to be there. He doesn't want to do it. But he gives her the gifts of the elements. And along the way, when she's in the, when she's in the um, valley, she's starving. Before she climbs the cliff, she can't figure out how to get up the cliff to the chariot. She wakes up, there's kibble for her dog, and there's food for herself. And she doesn't know where it comes from, but it comes from the magic man, who will provide for her, even when he completely disapproves of her. And most of you who know me know this is very autobiographical. <laughs> <laughs> So she gets from the hermit who freaks out the fool because he knows everything about her. He knew she would be arriving. He knew what quest she was on. He knew all the beautiful little pitfalls that she'd already fallen into and climbed out of. So she runs from him. And in running, she forgets why she's running. And she sees a beautiful butterfly, the same beautiful butterfly. Um, and she follows it. And it flies right through this membrane that's the Wheel of Fortune. That she think, and she slams right into it. Because it is a solid to her, but not to the butterfly. And it's like a mirror, a shimmering mirror, but it's reflecting the other world. And her side is reflecting her world, the lady's side. So they see their reflection, and neither of them really believes it. Neither of them can quite stand to see the other version of themselves, and they do not know how to come to terms with it. And I think the fool passes out. <laughs> she does. She passes out at this point because she really can't fathom that this is happening at all. But the Wheel of Fortune itself has the depictions, um, and you can see it's repeated here, but we'll get here. Don't look too much. <laughs> so it was carved by the Norns, the same ones that gave Odin the runes. And I, again, drew them as my beautiful lily, my little wise one. But they have a lot of the maiden mother crone symbolism. So here she has the silver in her hair. So they carved this wheel. And in its depiction are the four books of the Bible. And you can see when you look close at this one, I've, I've actually said so. Each element, again, that are in the aces, um, the, the wheel itself means this is your fate. This is your fate, and it's not the only time you get this opportunity. If you miss it, it's going to spin, it's going to spin, it's going to come around again, and you get another chance at it. So that's the, um, the fool passed out, but it's not her last shot. <laughs> she gets another shot at it. So, that, so she, she comes to the tower and goes through a lot of other things to get to... Um, where her man and her dog, she watches die at the tower. And she has, um, she builds a carn over their graves. And she goes out in oblivion without love, like all is lost to her. And she finds 
the pool of temperance, her best friend Stephen, but he's not there. So she lays by the pool, and the man, the Lord, never comes home that night. So when the fool sleeps, the lady awakens to spend time with her Lord, and he's not there. And so she lays down next to their beautiful pool in her world. And when they wake up, they see each other reflected in the water of Temperance's pool and of her beautiful pool. And the lady has all the questions, and the fool has more of the answers. Because the one who went on the vision quest did not know what she would find. And they found they were the same. And they strip naked in the star that we walked past because they know that that's just part of what defines their role. It's not who they are. And they become this one being that the sun takes bareback to the world. It takes her first to judgment, and all the souls come bursting out, and she finds herself flying. It all seems like a play to her, like everybody was in on it that was cahoots, and she's uh, pretty angry initially. Like, why did I have to suffer all of this if you're alive? And, um, and she realizes that she's all she needs. She and the four elements, the butterflies and the bees, that she is who she is. And that's the world. That's the story of the tarot. It's not evil at all. <laughs> so at this point, we've already told the story of the world. So now I want to tell the story of the storyteller. Um, and she helps us tell our stories. And when she was doing a writing workshop in Lavender Hills, Come here. <laughs> when she was doing a look, I want to see you. You have to come here. <laughs> so when she was doing a writing workshop at Lavender Hills, and I don't know, we'd been friends for a while, but you were still funny about my notions of things reincarnation and the tarot and all the symbology and the fairy world that I live in. But she had this beautiful experience in the lavender. And when I saw her after that, she says, if you're right about this whole reincarnation thing, I'm coming back as a lavender bee. <laughs> and she has everything to do with the show being here and provoking me into doing the things that I need to do in including, and maybe especially the books, telling of my stories. That's what she does so, so well. She edits it, she rearranges it, and she um, encourages me, and every once in a while she has to be a little firm with me, like maybe we don't need to go that far that way. <laughs> so this is the Queen Lavender Bee for my birthday girl. It's her birthday today. And so she has all the different little, she has her pencil, her watch, and her glasses required for her editing process. And she was born under the waning gibbous moon in Sagittarius. So that's for you, my darling. Aww. I love you, Jen. Thank you. So I just am going to shuffle these. I do the Celtic cross, which is very classic. Again, it's about the four spokes, equilateral cross. And then at the edge, it goes up to outcome. So <laughs> I have to get a little woo-woo and have you have a little collective moment of what the cards might want to tell us as a group. And then we need to pick up one of these. So you guys tell me which one. <laughs> this would be my left, center, or right. Who has, a, who has a feeling about it? The left. The left. Thank you, Cherie. Mm -hmm. The first card's a fool. <laughs> <laughs> so Cherie picked it right. <laughs> The second card 
is the star. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's remarkable because they were scrambled over here. There was no order to them. The queen of pentacles, the king of pentacles, mm. the chariot, and the two of swords, which happens to be Leilani. <laughs> hidden behind that big old monolith over there. <laughs> the sun, the queen of cups reversed, ace of swords reversed, and the card of daydreams, the seven of cups, and then the moon reversed. Okay, I think we can do this. <laughs> we didn't know till just now. I was pretty sure after the fool turned up. We might be okay. So the way these are arranged, each position has a different meaning. Each card, there's 78 of them, and the reversals have a different meaning. Um, the combinations, where they lay in relationship to each other, alters their meaning. So it's fairly endless. Um, the fact that we have two, three, four or five major arcana out of 11 cards it's way, way over the odds. <laughs> it's way over the odds, and I think it's that collective energy that helped them be chosen and tree. So the fool crossed by the star, it's basically, and I kind of brushed over that part of the story, is that all that potential that is, um, it can be called irresponsible because it's, she's completely unaware of responsibility. She doesn't have any dedication to anything so the fool is this fullness of being that doesn't have any direction, nothing but creativity, but she has no product because she can't focus it. Um, the star is that ability to recognize that you are always in the act of creation, that you are always um, becoming what you are, uh, that has all that wish upon a star kind of symbolism as well. It's the, um, so for the fool to be crossed by the star, and we call this the center cross, is that she's only pretending to just be without a thought in her head because she does have an intention. And she can realize that intention if she chooses to. And it's about staying in balance, all of the elements, all the things that we talked about. The star always has one, like it's a knee here, but sometimes one foot on earth, one foot in the water, so that it's the sensory existence and your emotional existence. There's a red bird in the tree in this one where it's saying, hark, <laughs> hark, and consider, and project yourself. So it's saying, I do have an intent, and I will. I just had a kind of feeling about where this is going. <laughs> where this, I do know where I'm going. This is the star's um, contribution to the fool um, and her own self-awareness of who she really is. So consciously, the queen of pentacles is the one who lives in her senses very happily, who is typically the wealthiest of the queens. She is the pentacle. She cares about home and heart. She cares about things Tauruses care about. <laughs> she cares about things Capricorns and Virgos care about. But she gives of that. She's the one who will feed you and care for you and nurture you. And um, she's part of our collective conscious mind. Like, you can have all this idealism and still have a worthy lifestyle, still have things, still have the tangibles, the um, comforting things of life. The king of pentacles is reversed in the subconscious. So where the king of pentacles is very similar to that meaning in the masculine sense, where it's a very feminine card in every way, he, um, he's reversed. And when the king of pentacles is reversed, he becomes very self-indulgent. So that's the warning of our subconscious, like, okay, if you've got a beef with money, like some of us might, <laughs> like, like some of us might think it's a form of prostitution <laughs> to sell the stuff of your soul, right? And what's your price for that? But you can become self-indulgent in that too. Like, who do you think you are not to be able to share this, not to be able to freely express like the queen in our conscious mind, in her upright 
position is telling us like it, you are only giving as you are it's an exchange that's a, that's a big one for me I don't know how you guys are doing <laughs> so the chariot behind us we talked about how the riddle has to be solved where it seems like there's no way to fly across the sky that these beasts will not cooperate they will not um, come together and make any sense out of this journey um, and the realization is a healing one that they are two halves of the whole. They are the yin yang, like I already said, I'm going to pronounce it that way forever. They are the yin yang, and they are the um, opposing binary forces, the female and the male, the masculine feminine forces that are already one and combined. And if we stay in balance, then that doesn't have to go rolling up into um, oblivion. So the recognition that we are one and we can fly leads us to the center cross again as the star and creating from that place. And then, because I'm a Gemini, we come to the Leilani card, and the Two of Swords is like, okay, let's think about this. <laughs> let's break it down. Let's think about this. We need to um, rationalize this, justify it. This is uh, what, if intellect is left to its own devices, it can be very whimsical but it's all for entertainment. <laughs> it doesn't actually apply it to anything. So the Two of Swords is a stalemate. Um, but the, it's depicted with the um, crescent waxing moon, the moon that's becoming, and the tides are behind her. The ocean is behind her, and the tides are moving. And the idea of remaining completely static and still is false. That is the illusion. And if you're a real air sign, you know it already. You know it already. And it matters less what the movement is as it is as more important just to move and to go on and carry on with your path. Follow your journey. Meet your quest. So that's the cross. That's the Celtic cross. These cards are called ladder to outcome. And they start with the sun and end with the moon, <laughs> which I think is lovely. <laughs> Especially we already got Apollo in here, we got it all. The, <laughs> the sun is in the position, the first card up the ladder is called the card of self. And the sun is an important card because it's about being very optimistic, um, which you can tell in the little story I told when it's Jake telling the lady like, oh, it's gonna be great. <laughs> That's the sun's approach to things. It's very, um, it, I, I would relate it to like if you're like me and you're barefoot in the warm ground with the beautiful soft grasses and the sun is shining on you and the flowers are all blooming and all the birds are singing. It's that kind of moment. The sun can be that optimistic and that um, full of hope and beauty. It always has sunflowers, so I added that to mine, that always follow the sun, always follow that most hopeful bright light. In our environment, I always got the switch back, right? In our environment, we have the Queen of Cups reversed, and that means she could get carried away. She could get emotionally carried away with all of this. She could stay right there. She could be like, okay, I've moved on from my Two of Swords and my rationalization, but now I'm not so sure about all this. Like, I just want to just bask in the sun for a while and think about it some more um, and feel about it some more or try to prevent myself from feeling all of this. So the, two, the Queen of Cups, if she's upright, she's much healthier than that. But in her, re Gretchen, sorry. <laughs> so in her reversal, she is um, either totally containing it or trying to just keep it in the super positive. And I've had a lot of lessons in the last year with COVID that, um, about toxic positivity and how um, truly uncaring it can be because it can be very much without empathy for what someone else is experiencing. And I think that pain is part of, and I tell, this is gonna seem like I'm going on a loop, Jen, you're gonna have to edit this out later. <laughs> <laughs> but my Rue, my butterfly fairy, and I'm gonna, I've decided that's what I'm gonna talk about in the last talk, again, like I did in the first, is the meaning of the word Rue which came to me in spirit, I believe, is for a very bitter herb, but it's a medicinal herb. 
and she's of the monarchs, so she drinks only milkweed. That's what sustains her, especially as a caterpillar, which is bitter. And she displays the orange and black so that she won't be eaten. <laughs> She's saying, I'm made of sour stuff. <laughs> you don't want to eat me. And that was interesting to me. Like I said, it came from spirit. I didn't know why my butterfly had to be rue. My fairy had to be rue. But over these times, and especially this last year, and it, maybe it's re-entering that chrysalis that she's born from, is there that realization that we know what's most important to us by our hearts. And if our hearts break over so, many, so much death and so much suffering and, and so much indifference, then that might be where our love is. That might be where our empathy truly lives. And that might be where growth is possible and unity of the two diverse sides can come together in a healing. So, okay. <laughs> the hopes and or fears is the ace of swords reversed. And it's a, li a little bit like the two of swords. The ace, if it were upright, all the aces, like we talked about in the very beginning, are about new beginnings. And the sword, most of all, I mean, it's a proclamation, like, this is who I am. This is what I stand for. I've got proof. I've got certainty inside of me, and I'm going to act on it. When it's reversed in hopes and or fears, it's like, I think I do. I hope I do. I'm looking at my Gemini's. <laughs> I, I believe I do. Um, but hopes and or fears is always the ninth card because it is that exactly of what we do hope for most dearly. We fear. We have a little fear. What we fear we have that little attraction to, that little hope for, that they're nearly the same thing. They're greatly overlapped. So that's like, it's all go get them, and then the ace is like, really? Are we really going to go get them? <laughs> but we are. <laughs> <laughs> so the next card is the seven of cups reversed again, and it means um, daydreams. It means daydreams in whatever positions it's in. When it's reversed, it's a reminder to dream the highest dream, to dream of wisdom and to dream of um, beauty and soul light and the highest um, being. Um, and on the same card, it has things depicted like fame and wealth and all that kind of stuff that is my fear, my turn off. So it's saying, as long as you dream and envision and wish on your star the highest possible motivation, the highest possible um, heart, then you're going to come to the moon. And although the moon is reversed, it's one of, well, it's the only one that is truly better reversed. Some of them are okay reversed. Um, and it means almost the same thing that it means upright. So the moon is a domestic dog and a wolf. It always has the crab for cancer playing her little music, trying to coax you through. Um, very much about that kind of relationship with our intuition and our emotion, our water. But it's also called, all the cards have nicknames, the card of clairvoyance, clear vision, being able to see, being able to know the truth, the wonder of what is spiritually possible and available to us all. When it's reversed, okay, when it's upright, I'll start it that way. When it's upright, you experience it like the domestic dog and you're very anxious about it. <laughs> so you're having the same experience of these beautiful epiphanies, and, and it shows flames coming down from the moon, like filling you up with joy. Um, but it's not comfortable, because it's like, this isn't how it works. This isn't how it works in the mechanical, four-square-cornered four world. And um, you resist it, and you yap at it, and you are pretty belligerent about it all. When it's reversed, it's the whoops experience, and it is natural. So if you see somebody who's very clairvoyant, and they'll be like, well, yes, of course. <laughs> they are experiencing moon song. Their wolf nature is one with the magic of the moon, and they know that all is as it should be, and it all is as it only can be. So that's our outcome, folks. <laughs>